All right. Well, wow. Thanks for braving the stormy weather out there. It's exciting. The power goes off. Don't worry. We'll just proceed in the dark. That's it. We'll be fine. Um, so tonight is part two of money. I want to refresh you a little bit on the highlights of part one, just to keep in mind as we move forward. Uh, remember, money is primarily functions as a utility. The, the example I used was a hammer, which I'll return to it. It has a function and needs to be applied to something. And, but the way it works, and this is where we want to spend tonight mostly, is remember it is symbolic. It in itself doesn't do anything. Money, money doesn't just really, it has a utility, but you can't really do anything with money itself. It's communal. You have to have, you can't have, having money all by yourself is just, just pointless. Because it just, it doesn't work that way. It has to be part of a, a, a community. And it's imaginary. Because you don't actually want money, nobody wants money, we want what money can do, which we'll talk about, you have to think of a future, and this requires imagination. So it's this very strange sort of tool where you, you have to have a group to use it, can't use it by yourself, and it really only functions in our imagination into the future. Um, and it is a symbol, it's a symbol of the things that we might be able to buy at some future date. It's a very strange sort of tool. When I left off, I mentioned, I said, you know, if your neighbor comes over and says, I'm building a fence, could I borrow a hammer? You say, sure. And so now he has, maybe he or she has two hammers. Um, and then if you see your neighbor drive up with a truckload of hammers, you think, well, that is very strange, unless this is a massive fence and he has an incredible amount of help. We would never make this mistake, right? We wouldn't go, oh, I'm building a fence, I need a hammer, I'll buy a thousand. Because wouldn't we just, you go, you need a hammer, you need certain things. Oddly, in theory, money should work that way. Money does not work this way. Because it's symbolic and it works in our imagination. To give you an idea of this, I want to just have you clear your minds for a moment. And I want you to imagine, back to imaginations, Imagine you are Bill Gates. Congratulations, you've just become one of the wealthiest people in the world. You have roughly 30 or 40 billion dollars in disposable income, probably in quarters. It's got rolls all over the place, right? Uh, I, I, now, just imagine you're Bill Gates, you got this 30 billion dollars burning a hole in your pocket. Now, what can't you buy? Right? What is it that you can't purchase with your 30 billion? billion dollars or more. Immortality. Yeah, oh, yeah, see, so you start pondering this. I, I came up with a rough list. It goes something like this. It says, uh, um, I started with salvation, enlightenment, liberation, ataraxia, apatheia, immortality, or asha. And these are all the stated goals of Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, Epicureanism, Stoicism, Taoism, and Zoroastrianism. <laughs> so if you take the major religions, the, okay, I'll do that more slowly, sorry. I'm going fast, all right, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so salvation, enlightenment, salvation, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, enlightenment or liberation, depending on your translation, Buddhism, I think liberation is better, but we tend to say enlightenment in the, in the West. Uh, ataraxia, which is Epicureanism, which is a state of sort of joyful peace. Uh, absence of pain, which they said was the greatest of all pleasures, which seems silly, but that's what they argued. Um, um, apatheia, which is uh, it's where we get the word apathetic. It really means indifference. Um, and uh, the Stoics were working towards a sort of enlightened indifference. Um, immortality, which is the goal of Taoism. Uh, that if you perfected yourself, you would live forever, uh, but you can never find the people who are immortal. They're sort of, that's part of the condition of being immortal. No one can find you. Uh, and and uh, uh, it's true. No, this is true. I'm not making that up. Uh, and Asha, which is the, um, in Zoroastrianism, this is the state where you live in, basically you c c commune with Ahura Mazda. He's the, He's the great god of, of the Zoroastrian tradition. And, and if you, you're sufficiently good and moral and upright, then basically you will you live, you bet you basically join with the god in one way of thing, or you live with him. It's sort of a bit vagueish, but that's the idea. But for money, notice none of these, in fact, every one of these religions either emphatically or periodically says money will poison you. 
Right? Money does not help you achieve ataraxia. It doesn't help you achieve alliteration. Buddhists don't say, step one, get a 401k. <laughs> right? This is not like the first of the eightfold path is not 401k. <laughs> Followed by good real estate investment. Right? This is, if I remember the eightfold path correctly, those aren't in there. Um, so then the next group of things I was pondering, that you, you know, things you can't purchase, even if you're Bill Gates, health, youth, Genes, family, friends, community, peace of mind, courage, willpower, discipline, insight, wisdom, or knowledge. Which aren't good anyway. Uh, you don't want that stuff. But like health. How, how much would uh, you know, the Bill Gates or youth pay to be 80 years younger or 50 years younger? Probably a lot. Probably billions. A billion a decade or something. Who knows? But you can't, you can't do that yet. You know, hold on. Uh, science is working furiously. Uh, but but as so far, no, no good. Genes, right? We, we, are, we inherit our genes. We have no choice. Same thing with family. We do not choose our families. Our, we're just shoved into our families, right? We just appear, and there we are. And, and as you get older, you must do a fair bit of looking around going, really? <laughs> Something got switched there in the old, you know? And you go, what, what are, what are you going to do? It's, it's family. Right? Friends you can choose, but generally not supposed to purchase them. Tends to put a bit of a <laughs> different feel in the relationship if you're just renting them for the weekend. Uh, c c community, right? We all, everybody talks about how important community is, but it's such a difficult thing to, to purchase. And people try to do this all the time. They try to set up artificial communities, walled, gated communities. I like call them gated communities. Keep the bad people out, lock the good people in. Um, you know, it, it's, it never tends to work out that well. Um, courage, willpower, discipline, insight, wisdom, all these that are elements of your nature or your, or your being, these, these you, you, know, you can't buy them. If you ever thought, oh, I wish I was just more disciplined or I had more willpower or a little more courage, um, you know, I don't know, maybe money would make you more courageous, but probably not. It would make you probably worry about money, right? If you're fearful, <laughs> having money will probably, so truly, like psychologically, it will exacerbate your fear, not make you less fearful. Oh, I could lose it. The more you get, the more fearful you become, oddly. Um, any skill, uh, playing the piano, playing basketball, being able to build a house or a wooden box or anything, anything that is a skill cannot be purchased. I mean, this is the great, I always love it when you see uh, beautiful pianos. This is sort of the Steinway market, right? If you, if you want a beautiful piano, you buy a Steinway. This doesn't help you play a piano. You don't need a Steinway to play beautiful. Well, they are beautiful pianos. I'm nothing against Steinways. But, you know, play all, that's perfectly fine. Bosendorfer, great piano. But, you know, really, to be able to play a piano simply takes dedication, discipline, skill, knowledge, practice, musical outlook, musical predisposition. Uh, but we know that musical skill is not equally distributed in the community. My favorite example is Sviatslav Richter, who swears, and in fact the evidence suggests, never practiced or played scales in his entire life, only ever played music. He's one of the most brilliant pianists of all time, and he just played music, just started playing songs and kept playing songs. That's his argument. And people said no one ever saw him practice, and so it seems <laughs> truish that that was how he learned. You know, he was just sort of born that way, maybe. Uh, Mendelssohn springs to mind on that front. Um, basketball, right? So Bill Gates, no matter how much he spends, will not be a good basketball player. I actually imagined him buying the NBA, firing all the players, and only hiring people to play who are worse than he was. So he could be the all-star of the NBA. But see, it's not really the same. <laughs> That's theoretically possible, but emotionally, psychologically, probably not as fulfilling, unless you're a sociopath or something. Um, so yeah, any skill... Um, any of the arts, painting, sculpting, writing, dancing, composing, any of that, skills, education, knowledge, education, you can't buy an education. You can pay for school, that's no problem, um, but you can't buy an education. At some point you have to, you know, read books, learn things, write things, ponder. This is the hard part, uh, part people don't like to do. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and so step one for us is to recognize, even though it runs contrary to everything in our culture, that... Well, look at this list. All of the things associated with all the major philosophical and religious schools the last few thousand years. Health, youth, family, friends, skills, 
experience, right? They can't be purchased. But our view of money and what we feel is, oh, but if we had money, of course, it would work for us, <laughs> right? Other foolish people, of course, would waste it or blow it and I, but we <laughs> would know how to use this. Um, as a first approximation, if you look on the back of the little handout there, to understand how advertising works in our psychology, almost invariably, 80, 90% of the time, advertising advertises or markets what you can't buy. Because it turns out we generally don't really want what we can buy. We want what we can't buy. Um, and because we don't want what we can't buy, wait, how do I get this right now? Because we can't buy what we want, they have to convince us that the product somehow has something to do with what we actually can purchase. So if you look at this great, I just love this Budweiser ad. It's from like the 70s or something. But, it, you know, you've got this, this attractive young woman laying on the grass, I have no idea, with a bunch of puppies. <laughs> and then there's this beer being poured in. And it says, where there's life, underlined, there's Bud. <laughs> because Budweiser gives you life. Life like attractive young women and puppy dogs. <laughs> it's a weird ad. I just love this ad because it's so weird. But all you have to do is just type in a car ad or beer ad or any kind of potato chip ad in Google Images, and you'll just see this whole raft of images that are promising. If you just eat this potato chip, your life will be like this. If you drink this beer, you'll be surrounded by naked women. If you buy this apple, you know, all these amazing things will happen to you, which of course we know will not happen. However, advertising works. And it works because we want those things that we can't purchase. And so we live in this bizarre psychological tension where we, we, if we have money, and generally we do, we have disposable income, we want to dispose of it, and we want all these good things. You know, we want enlightenment, we want friends, community, peace of mind, willpower, discipline, to be able to play the piano or build a house. We want to do that. But the money doesn't really help. If it helps at all, it's a little teeny tiny part. And so instead, we buy beer, and then we get <laughs> puppy dogs, right? The puppy dogs come with beer. There's a dog in every six-pack. Like one of the cans, you open and a puppy dog comes out. I think that would be great. Uh, probably inhumane. Um, yeah, uh, the other ad, which I, I have no idea, but it's a little girl praying. This is for an antacid, by the way, if you can't read that. It says, immediate and sustained protection against acid reflux. And I, I, I love it, but it's a picture of a little girl praying with her eyes closed. And I love that because it's, if you have acid reflux, what you want is immediate relief, like divine intervention. <laughs> this is what I guess the psychology was. So if you buy this product, it is like purchasing divine intervention, which I think if you go back, uh, it's Catholicism, right, where they would say, where they'd sell that, hey, if you've committed a crime, just give us some money, and, and you get off, right? This is sort of the old Catholic version of that, but no one believed in it then, and I'm not sure that buying this antacid will bring divine intervention. <laughs> but do, if you look at advertising, almost invariably, not quite, but almost invariably, it tries to convince you that you will get one of the goods that is not purchasable if you buy the thing that you do. So, um, again, musical instruments are just the greatest example of this because, you know, there's guitar pornography where they just have these beautiful handmade guitars everywhere. People collect guitars or pianos, you know, just all this stuff. And, piano. and it's like, no, really, most good musicians could play anything. I think it was the, the jazz drummer Max Roach who hated to set up drums so he wouldn't travel with them. And they said, well, what kind of drums do you want? And he said, I don't care. Just have some drums out there. I'll play them. He wasn't that concerned. He's like, I can play, you know, drums. I can play them. I don't care what you put there. I'm Max Roach. I'm going to sound good. Uh, and, and so it's nice to have the beautiful instrument and all that, but we, we get awfully confused, I think. Uh, and you can see it in, in every other kind of example. Probably the greatest, and then we'll move on, because I think this is pretty obvious, yeah? 
uh, is the Air Jordan tennis shoes, right? Where here's Michael Jordan, handsome, successful, incredibly talented basketball player, and here's his shoes. <laughs> I can't buy him. I can't buy his skills or his capacity or his focus or his brilliance, but I can buy the shoes. Unfortunately, the shoes are not my problem. <laughs> Complete lack of coordination is my problem. <laughs> and, and an unwillingness to spend a thousand hours in the gym bouncing a basketball, right? It's interesting for a while and then it gets boring to me. You know, so I'm not going to be good at that. So, but I can buy the shoes. I could buy a million dollars worth of shoes. Uh, and you know what? I'm still not going to be good. I'm not even going to be actually any better. Uh, Michael Jordan could beat me barefoot. He could beat me, you know, it's just, it's just shoes are not going to be the issue. But that's where we focus on. Um, and we believe, but we believe in the power of money. A second way you can see this is the fact that if there is a problem, the solution almost invariably that first springs to our minds is throw money at. And two examples of this, one is on, is on the front there, which is the, in, in, in the state of Washington, the state Supreme Court has found that the state is liable for not spending enough money on basic education, K through 12. This is almost certainly true. And so as this has kicked off almost a decade of legal battles over how much money the state should spend, where the money should come from, where the money should go, all of this, and, and so just there's a, a, a brief excerpt from it, um, on January 25th, the state Supreme Court ruled in the McCleary versus Washington that Washington State is not amply funding basic education under the state constitution. The paramount duty of the state is to provide ample support for basic education. Article 9, Section 1 confers on children in Washington State a positive constitutional right to amply funded education. Excellent. So this debate has been going on, and this debate will go on. There's going to be a big sturm and drang in this year's uh, th this session of Congress coming up in 2015 for the state because they don't have the money and they don't know what they're going to do to come up with it. But I thought, well, consider all the things about education you could change without spending more money on it. And that's the list I gave you. And I came up with uh, subjects taught, texts that are used, to teach, how subject material is taught, who is allowed to teach, how much time is spent on a topic, how much time is spent in research, how much the school day is structured, how classes are divided, how students are evaluated, how teachers are evaluated, how administration is evaluated, how classrooms are organized, what type of assignments are required or precluded, when students are expected to learn a subject or a skill, how students are grouped, how large classes should be, number of classes students are expected to take, length of the school year, how vacations should be structured, amount of homework students are expected to complete, how many years of schooling students receive, what, if any, state exam should be required, expected role of parents, manner and type of extracurricular activities offered. I could go on. None of this is being debated. None of this is part of the argument. Even though I would suggest, I don't care how much money they spend, quadruple it, quintuple it, if you don't address these, you're probably not fundamentally changing the nature of education. So if you think the education of Washington State is fine the way it is, great. Spend more money on it. If you don't think it's fine the way it is, it's weird to spend more money on it. <laughs> think how strange that would be. It's like if you're renting an apartment you don't like, <laughs> and you said, you know what, I'm going to give my landlord more money. <laughs> that you would know. We would never think that. We would think, this is a crappy apartment. I may be stuck with it, but I certainly don't want to give more money to it. Or I might like to move, but no, we're actually going to take a system that many people find there are flaws in um, and give it more money. Now, this may help, but it may not help because it seems like all these other things are very important. Now, if the money were channeled into various ways, that might be an issue. But that's really, honestly, if you look at the debate, what's being talked about is amount of dollars per student, period. So if you spend more money per student doing something that's not helpful, you've accelerated the bad. <laughs> if you spend more money per student on things that are helpful, you've accelerated the good. But we haven't really made these determinations because what we believe in is money. An even more extreme example, this one is hard to believe, but I, you can look the numbers up, I swear this is true. 
Military spending in the United States in the year 2000 was $300 billion, a little more than that actually, which is a goodly amount for your military. We want a military. We've got a nice military. We've got the top military, number one. We've got like the 20 top militaries. Um, <laughs> 2001, September 11th, right, we're attacked by Al-Qaeda. Their budget estimated by the CIA at $30 million that year. So we were literally spending at least 10,000 times more money a year than Al-Qaeda. And we had been doing so for a long time. And so what did we do in response to the attacks? We dramatically increased the military budget. By 2003, not counting the Iraq and Afghanistan war, not counting those, we were spending over $400 billion, which means we'd increase our military spending by $100 billion a year, roughly 30%. So we were now outspending Al-Qaeda about 12,500 to one. See how silly that is? That's nigh on insane. It's crazy to go, we've been attacked by people. They, they think that 9-11 attacks cost $500,000. Right? So we, we, we increased it like from 10,000 to one to 12,500 to one. Why? Therapeutic. This is my argument. It's ther we feel good because we know that money solves problems. So if we increase our per student spending on education in the state, which we probably need to do, but if we do, then we think, oh, we've done something. In fact, we've done the most important thing. We've thrown money at it. If we're attacked, then what should we do? We should spend money. Indeed, we should just bury our enemies in cash. <laughs> I think it would be cheaper to just drop cash, right? We're going to carpet bomb your country in $20 bills until you leave us alone. Right? I think it would work, too. I think they would be like, Phew. That was the quarters you mentioned. The quarters. Drop quarters. They, that's a good idea. They would hurt a lot worse. You're right. Nickels and quarters for everybody until you leave us alone. Right? So on one hand, it's silly, and we know it's silly, but on the other hand, we can't help ourselves. This is the psychology of money. Money is this big, empty vessel into which we pour our hopes, our dreams, our fears, our beliefs, our doubts our self-esteem, our self-image. Think about another example, I was, I was part of this. Let's imagine, listen, everybody knows it's good to work at Google and Apple. Nobody knows what anybody who works at Google and Apple does. A few people do. I assume somebody at Google knows. We don't know, generally as a population, but we do know they make a lot of money. They do cool things and they make cash. Ipso facto, good job. So imagine the fast food industry paid like a quarter of a million dollars a year and you get like fifty or seventy-five thousand dollar bonuses. People would be like, "Oh yeah, you know, my daughter, she's a assistant manager at Taco Bell," <laughs> and everybody would be like, "Oh, well, that's pretty good. That's a, a Taco Bell, you know, that's shit. That's that's some stuff, you know. That's that's Taco Bell. There'd be mag school. Forget STEM. All the STEM education crap. That would be gone. What we'd be talking about is fast food education, FFE." <laughs> FFE programs so that we can get our kids into the programs that they need to be in to make America strong because that's where the cash is, right? Absolutely. I mean, have no doubt this would be true. And you can track this with wages. High wage things are interesting, fascinating, important, valuable. When they become low wage things, eh, forget it. Another way to think about this, the Ebola scare got me pondering this, um, all of the high-tech, incredibly well-educated, incredibly dedicated people working at the CDC, we don't care jack about them. Because really, they don't make that much money compared to internet startup people. I like to think the people at the CDC are doing something valuable and constructive, helping us with plagues and vaccines and all kinds of exciting things like that, but we don't care about the content. We care about the cash. And as much as we like to pretend like this isn't true, it's true. <laughs> we just, as a society maybe, individually not, but as, as a commune, as a society, we really believe in the power of money to transform the individual. What's the difference between a rich person and a poor person? In theory, nothing. In fact, everything. 
But don't think, if you do feel this way, don't be surprised. You did not invent our society. One of the great things, or not so great things about America is we are the cash society par excellence. One of the things that everybody says about the United States from the rest of the world is we are obsessed with money. And they say this because we are obsessed with money. <laughs> this, is, this is the reason they say it. And there's very good reasons for this. Uh, one of them, and I, I put this here on the front page, many North American English colonies were founded as companies. It's important to remember this. I, as far as I can tell, this is pretty much unique in world history. I, I can't find another significant example. People talk about the influence of corporations and money in American politics. This is American politics. This is who we are. This is where we come from. We were founded as joint stock companies. <laughs> now, we had a few Puritans, and that's a very powerful strain as well. And they had their religious settlements. And that's another thing. Actually, we're going to do a section on religion. We'll talk more about those people then. But most of the people who came over came over as part of an economic, for economic opportunity or as part of an economic development plans. The early colonies, several of them, and two of the largest ones, Jamestown being one of the most significant colonies, were literally joint stock companies. This is what they were set up to do. They were designed to return money because they were companies. You were an employee of the company. Um, the, all of the colonies in the late 1700s, uh, 17th century, was handed over to the management in England of the Board of Trade, the trade lords. So we were founded as stock companies uh, and directed pretty much by people who were interested in trade, international trade, tariffs, taxation, all of this. I mean, this is who we are. This is who we've been forever. And we'll talk about uh, the kinds of interesting problems this, this creates in our sort of outlook. But it's important to recognize that um, it's easy to list all the things that money can't buy, and yet our whole society is built to, to defy that. We, we believe in the power of money because it is the medium of exchange for everything. Right? Whatever you want, we think and feel, and often is true, money is the deciding issue. Where does this come from? Like I said, part of it comes from our history, um, the fact that we were founded by the people. We were, we were, the people who came here were the people most likely to feel that way. But in other societies, historically speaking, again, we're, by the way, I should mention again, most people for most of human history had little or nothing to do with money. They did not live in a cash society. Money has been around for as far back as we can go pretty much. But most people had nothing to do with it. The United States, we were the radical experiment in freedom, liberation, independence, all the things we, we learn about in school. But what does this mean in, in, in practice? Well, what other values are there besides cash? You have a king who can confer preference. So most societies with kings or emperors, lots of people spend a lot of time lobbying, jockeying for position to get preference. Often this included cash, but it was titles, ribbons. Napoleon made jokes about this, that it, you know, he could print a ribbon and make somebody a grand marshal, and that would save him you know, 10,000 francs because he didn't have to give them any money. And they thought it was great. And he was like, hey, idiot, here you go, have a ribbon. Right? But it, but it conferred status. And so people love that. We don't have that. You could have an aristocracy. Again, aristocracy, you, you are born to who you are. That's, that when you're born, you know your identity. You have rights and privileges, often property, but not necessarily. You have obligations and duties, sometimes to a king, sometimes not. Sometimes to your peasants, sometimes not. But you know where you stand in the world. You know, or, or you could be a peasant which means often in historical societies, you were not allowed to move if you were a peasant. Freedom of movement is a new idea, new itch, historically speaking. So you knew everybody. You might go years without seeing a stranger. You lived in it, we, people talk about community. Yeah, community is value. Humans love community. We're communal animals. 
as, as you know, Aristotle says, we're, we're the political animal, but he meant the, the polis animal, the animal of the city. We're the, we like to be in groups. We need to be in groups. We aren't healthy without groups. But our country was founded by all the people who left their groups. <laughs> and we've been leaving ever since. <laughs> We are an extraordinarily and unbelievably mobile society. I, I mean, you must have heard this, but I've talked to many people who have said, you know, I keep moving around looking for community. <laughs> and, and on one hand, I know what they mean. On the other hand, that's completely self-defeating. Because mobility is roughly the opposite of community. And so even the lowliest peasants had a vastly greater sense of community and belonging and identity than anybody does really, I would say, today. It's almost impossible to imagine what that would be like for us because we're so unbelievably mobile. It's something like the average American moves within a few miles of their house every three years and outside 70 miles every seven which is to say you basically move to a new community every seven or eight years. And that's the average, of course, you know, there's variables on each end. But some extraordinary figure like that. Where, you know, if, you're, if people actually say, I say, well, we're, no, we're moving a while, my job said I'm, I'm going to go for my job. Okay, career, right? That's, you move to where the job is. Because your job is more important than your family, your friends, or your community. Why? Because that work, that money that you get is your identity. And it, um, it, it's easy to imagine if somebody said, well, I'm not going to move because I don't want a job, so I'll just be unemployed and live at home with my parents. <laughs> we know what that person is. We call them a bum. <laughs> <laughs> right? In our society, that person is an awful bad person. You're worthless. You're no good. You aren't out earning the money that gives you an identity. In most societies, for most of history, the choice to stay home with your family was just obvious. Anybody who would leave their family to go away, well, that was very suspicious. You're leaving your family? Well, what about your family? Aren't you supposed to be there helping them? We go, oh, I'll call. Maybe not. <laughs> right? This is, and so one of the curious things about the United States is we've eliminated all of the sources of identity that have historically <coughs> allowed people to feel like they have a sense of self, a sense of belonging, a sense of worth. And the only thing that's left, which has been there historically, is money, is wealth. Wealth has always been good. Don't be confused about this. People haven't been confused historically. They're like, yeah, wealth is a kind of good. Ah, but it used to be one of many possible goods. Today, it's all the other goods have sort of been tamped down in our society to an extraordinary degree. Um, there's a, a, a couple years ago when the big um, uh, action Marvel movie, The Avengers, the big Avengers movie came out. In the United States, there are all these reviews of it. It's fascinating, right? I read reviews in a German newspaper and a French newspaper for comparison. And both those newspapers that I read, I can't remember what the newspapers were, but the art articles were quite fascinating. But in the German, there's a great term in German called Geltbagger. Uh, and it means it's like a, a money sucker, because a, a, a bagger is like a, is like a dredger, right? So it's a, a, a money dredger. And the reviewer said, look, clearly this movie was made just to make money. But it is actually a good movie. And then they talked about the qualities of the movie. The French article said something very similar. Look, you're probably surprised we're reviewing this movie. But we want to <laughs> let you know that even though it's designed simply to make money, there's actually some redeeming features to it. It's a movie you might consider seeing. That qualification in the United States was never made. <laughs> because... The notion that there's a category of things designed to make money, which they all recognize and understand, they're not confused about this, and then there's a category of, in this case, good movies, movies you might want to see. <laughs> in the United States, the amount of money that a movie makes is its goodness. 
If it makes five billion dollars, it is a good movie. In fact, it's the greatest movie ever made. And you can just go down from there. And this is what they report, right? Ooh, a weak opening for this movie. Not whether it was a good movie or a bad movie. Weak opening means they didn't make a lot of money. And everything runs this way. Music albums. Oh, if you sell a lot of an album, it's a good album. If you don't, it don't. If an artist makes a, two albums in a row that sell a lot, and they make a third one, people go, oh, she's slipping. <laughs> Something's wrong with this artist. Or maybe not, right? I mean, it could be possible they just didn't sell very much. Is that what determines the greatness of art? Answer, yes. <laughs> that is our discernment. If you see an article, look, look in, in the, in, particularly if you look in the popular press, not, not in the actual like art historical press. If it's an article about art, it is almost, not always, almost always about oh, this painting sold for $55 million. Can you believe it? Of course, it's outrageous. Who would pay $55 million for a painting? Of course, they don't say anything about the painting because the people who don't have the vocabulary or the intellectual resources to discuss art. <laughs> but they do know that $55 million sounds like a lot of money for a painting. And that's what we can discuss. And so this is our denominator for everything. Is your job good? Well, how much do you make? Is it a good painting? How much did it auction for? Is that a good guitar player? Well, how much does it, how many albums does he sell? Does she, is she a good singer? Well, how many, how many, two, how much were ticket sales this year on tour? This is our denominator for basically all good things. Good things sell a lot and make money. Bad things do not. Because if we don't demarcate it that way, then who's supposed to decide? In most countries you have, and, in, and throughout history, you had sort of educated people who knew about the field who would act as critics. This is an original idea of critic as somebody said, hey, you might want to go see these paintings. You might enjoy them. Or, ooh, saw these paintings. Ooh, I don't know. Take a look at them. See what you think. Not impressed. But we don't like the notion of people being, this is part of getting rid of your aristocracy, is this leveling. We don't want people to be better than us. I don't have to submit to your judgment in anything because it's a free country. Right? I don't know much about art, but I know what I like. <laughs> Which is a right, ridiculous statement. Because if you don't know about art, how the hell do you know what you like? <laughs> do you like opera? No. Have you been to an opera? No. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> How do you know if you don't like it? If you haven't seen it, experienced, touched it. The only way you can know what you like is to know about it. I mean, this, is, this, is, this is the idea. If you don't experience, you can't know. Ah, but if it is famous or if it's hugely valuable, <laughs> then we know it's good. It's something to see. When, when the, uh, some Impressionist paintings came to Seattle a couple years ago, this was one of the things that was big in the newspaper. It was like, I forget, a quarter of a billion dollars of Impressionist paintings come to the sand. Like raining nickels or quarters on our opponents, they should just put dollar bills up in the museum. <laughs> Look, here's the money. Because it's what we want to see. Look at all that money. Good Lord, that's very nice money they have there. What a pile. <laughs> You know, but because really, does the money matter? If it was worthless, if nobody wanted to buy it, would it make it less good? Yes. The answer is yes, because this is what we have left to judge with. We judge by price. This is, this is our main criteria. And it throws us off completely. When we encounter things that aren't denominated in money or in cash, it really frustrates our society. Like, like the problem with international terrorism. Well, we spend 100 billion more, and they still don't like us. <laughs> <laughs> we'll spend another 100 billion. We will, too. Uh, absolutely. There's no doubt. We'll spend many, we'll spend another trillion. We won't do anything different. We keep bombing them, and they still don't like us, right? <laughs> How many bombs do we have to buy for them? Um, you know, the, the, the notion that all this money is, is not helpful, perhaps unhelpful, one 
posits, um, and that we might need to change our approach, our outlook. Yeah, see that? No, we're not going for it. We're not. We're just no. Um, and and this is this is our struggle. And what's weird about this, or another weird thing about this, if we look at it historically, is if this approach, this notion that everything responds to money, even though we know that it doesn't, makes us always feel like we need more money to use to apply to those things that money cannot, in fact, address. This is why we feel poor all the time, even though we are by far the wealthiest society history has ever even imagined. We are so spectacularly rich, the poorest people in the United States, spectacularly rich by any historical standard. This is hard to imagine, but it's true. Look, go back to historical documents. What it used to mean to be poor was, I have no clothes and I freeze to death in the wintertime. Even people who were sort of middle class lived in filth and doubt and disease. Like Edward Gibbon, uh, the, the historian um, who wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, I think he was the fifth child named Edward Gibbon. They just kept naming all the sons Ed because they figured they weren't going to live to maturity, and they were right. He was the only one that survived to maturity, and I think he was number five. He might have been six. It's some horrifying number like that. We don't have that. We don't have these incredible child mortality rates. We have heat in the wintertime. This is a spectacular breakthrough. Louis XIV did not have heat in the wintertime. This is why they wore furs. Why were furs incredibly, spectacularly valuable? Because nobody had heat. They're, they're recorded of ambassadors and stuff in Versailles. They said that the wine would freeze on the dinner table. That's no good. <laughs> That's bad, right? It, most everybody, even relatively poor people, a few people don't have heat, most everybody in the United States has heat. This is unheard of in world history. In fact, it's probably not even the average for the world today. Um, if you look at the numbers since 1900, um, our purchasing power parity, you know, they do all these equations, it's from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The amount of money we each have for disposable things has roughly tripled per household. They track it by household because that's how taxes are paid, of course. Um, at the same time, the number of people per household has dropped basically in half, which is also a sign of wealth. When you used to live five people to a house, then you drop down, ah, recession comes in, people, more people start living per house. But basically, we have half as many people per house, and they have three times as much money, which means we have per capita five to six to seven times more wealth, more disposable income than people did in 1900. And 1900 was at the end of an incredible boom in personal wealth. If you go back to 1800, it's not even, it's not even, it's just, we're just extraordinarily, spectacularly, totally rich. It's an amazing achievement. It's really an amazing achievement to be spectacularly rich and feel poor all the time. <laughs> this is the coolest thing. This is the great thing about the psychology of money. <laughs> to have achieved wealth that is truly unimaginable in the history of the world and to still feel need and want. Oh, that's the magic psychology of money. And to understand money, you, got, you have to understand this. The thing is, again, money is imaginary. There is no end to the human imagination. The human imagination is essentially infinite. Nobody used to ever want a private plane. For instance, planes didn't exist. <laughs> when planes were invented, a few people thought, oh, that would be cool. I want my own plane. And so for a while, that was really cool. Then people thought, oh, I want my own jet. Because just having your own plane, that's no good. When jets exist, some people want jets. And now they're, they're, there's a company, this is true, there's a company that's designing a supersonic jet. It's going to be really like you know, a quarter of a billion dollars or something, but it'll get you all over the world in something like five hours. Go anywhere you want, five hours or less. So that's cool, going to want one of those. 
Um, so, you know, and the same thing is true with cars and food and, uh, you know, whatever it is you can imagine, there is no end to our need because there's no end to the human imagination. And whenever we talk about wealth and poverty and money and all this, we always say, oh, what do people need? It's important to remember that we left need at least 100 years ago as a society. And even that's arguable. We probably left need 150 years ago. We haven't been worried about need for a long, 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 long time. Again, you do, just go back to before 1900 and read the literature. You have all the characters, not all, many of the characters in Dostoevsky, they're like, oh, I, I want to get a job, but I don't have a shirt. So I borrow a shirt from my friend for the interview and I rip a hole in it on the way. Like, you know, see, think about that. We don't think of poverty as being, I don't have a shirt. We think of poverty as like, wow, my family can't afford to send me full ride to college. So the government should step in and help. Right? Because that sort of levels the playing field. And if you don't have that, then you're in want. Right? You've, been, you've lost out on something. I think it's good for people to get a college education, so I think it's a good idea. But notice, historically, this is just crazy. People would just say, why don't you just pass gold out to everybody? Or, or food. I, I think I've used the example before, but they used to call it um, a coffee diet. Coffee had been invented, and it turns out that coffee is an appetite suppressant. And so when people couldn't eat, they would just drink a lot of coffee. A lot of coffee. So if they'd say things, I'd write letters to their friends, oh, saving up to buy, you know, something for my girlfriend so I haven't been eating for the last three days, been on a coffee diet. And I'm like, whoa. See, we don't think of this as normal. For most of human history, the notion of not eating for two or three or four or five days was like, well, yeah, sure. Sometimes you don't have food. That's just the way things are. That didn't make you poor. It just made you normal. So that, I mean, so this is where we've come from. And now we enter a society, you know, where we, we're just long gone from there. Almost no attachment. And we still feel poor. How do you explain this? Ah, it's the psychological power of money. It's a symbol of every possible desire we've ever had. And that symbol is reinforced through advertising and marketing. By the way, all the evidence suggests without advertising and marketing, consumption plummets, which is fascinating. We have to be continually prompted and reminded, hey, 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 you've only got a plane, you need a jet. You've got a crappy small jet, you need a bigger jet. Somebody else has a jet that's much bigger than yours or much faster. <laughs> right? That, that's continuous. And, and this unnerving of our psychology of, of, of unease. And we think, oh, you know, I don't have the right watch, so I've got to get to spend $100,000 on a nice Piaget watch. I don't, you know, it, particularly for women, oh, you're ugly. Right? All fashion advertising is basically designed to say, by the way, you're an ugly person. Uh, but we can help you out. If you give us some money, we can make you somewhat less ugly. And if you continuously give us money, then we can sort of help your ugliness out and cover it up and ambush it in various ways. But there's only so much we can do. But if you continually spend money on us, we will do what we can for you, right? Subtly unnerve you, make you feel unworthy all the time. All the time. You, you don't have the right guitar, you don't have the right car, you don't have the right shoes, you don't live in the right neighborhood, you don't have the right haircut, you don't have the right makeup, you don't have, right, whatever it is, it's not quite good. And if it was good enough last year, <laughs> this is why everything is always new and improved. <laughs> because if, if it was just as like, look, we sold you this car last year, it's gonna be the same damn car next year, so you're good. Just, <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not good anymore, it's bad, it's a year old, you took the wrapper off. Right? And it's just continually working. So that but 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 so we're in this world of, of psychology where our needs 
are not what's at issue, at least are what are survival needs. Our animal needs are not a question. Ah, it's all of the other things that we want. Health and youth and family and friends and community and peace of mind and liberation and enlightenment. Security. Security. Ah, yes, get a piece of the rock. <laughs> right? It's such, such a be- I love that ad because it's so perfect. And I always think, yeah, that's what they're going to put on your tombstone, a rock. <laughs> right? I don't want a piece of the rock. And, like, and, and it's sort of the, 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 the total extension of this rationale is I don't want to outlive my money. Right? People say this. Which... It, a, it's a lie. We all know this is a lie at some level because of some, you know, no, we don't care. We want to live. All the evidence is we want to live as long as we can, unless we're in you know, some horrible pain. But if we're doing good, we feel all right, we want to live forever. Like I always say, I want to live longer than the concept of money. I want people to ask me, hey, old dude, tell us about when there used to be this thing called Monet. <laughs> and I'll be, you know, I don't even remember how that works. So, right, so I don't, you outlive your money, absolutely, we all want to do that, right? But, we, but the, the, our society tells us, no, no, no. And if you look at all the retirement literature, it's all about, oh, save and fund and, you, you know, put more money away. And if you put a lot of money away, then you start talking about, by the way, if you're very wealthy, they start talking about generational wealth. So it's not just enough to save money and invest for you. Now you have to save and invest money for the generations that come after you. I'm not making this up, so just check this. It's called generational wealth. I love this concept. Because if somebody finds, well, I've got a billion. Well, what more do I need? It's oh, ho, ho. <laughs> and notice the great thing here is the future is uncertain. And so the security of money, uh, dicey. So they say, well, I've got this much. Oh, you never know. Inflation could happen. Gold could plummet. Oil could skyrocket. The Canadians could invade, right? Something (laughs) could happen so that what you think is enough has finally become insufficient. And it's all in our minds. And so, ooh. By the way, I looked at this for the the lecture. uh, They did a couple of reasonably good surveys of people who were 70 and older. (laughs) Uh, what do they regret and what advice do they have for young people? Um, one survey was of 1,500 people, roughly half who were 70 and older, and like 20% were 100 and older. So really skewing very old. Um, I mean, 100 is old, right? Let's face it. If you're over 100, good, good on you. Uh, I hope you've outlived your money. Screw them, you know. Just <laughs> run up deck. Uh, you know, the... the um, but they... Of the one survey of 1,500 respondents, the, the guy who was doing it said not one said anything about money. Not one said anything about working more. Not <laughs> none, zero. They were all about all this stuff. Community, peace of mind, get exercise, take care of yourself. Travel when you're young. This was a big one. They said, hey, you think you're going to travel later, but the older you get, the harder it gets. Those steps in Rome look mighty fine when you're 25. They look less good when you're 85, <laughs> right? Take pictures of them at a distance, uh, you know, <laughs> that, that kind of thing. And, and they talked about, hey, if you're in a job you don't like, quit it. This was like one of the big, they said, look, if you're in a job you don't like, quit it. Just now, just right now. Don't even think about it. Just go quit. Uh, because they said there is no reason to do this to yourself. There's no amount of money in the world that makes it, make you're suffering through this time worthwhile. So this is what the people who are there say. It would be like if you're going to travel to a country and you talk to all the people who are there and they all say, hey, it's cold, bring a sweater and some warm shoes. And then you talk to all the people who advise you on taking trips there and they all say, it's warm, take shorts and sunscreen. (laughs) Because it's totally different advice. The people who are advising you, who often just coincidentally work for financial companies, suggest <laughs> that it's all about money. If you have enough money, your retirement will go great. You'll, you know, they always have the pictures of the grandkids on the yacht, and the, it's warm, and everything is lovely. We know this, right? And if not, well, then you end up decrepit on the street. 
Particularly if you, if you think you're going to live on Social Security, you, you may as well just live on the street now to get used to it. <laughs> Put some newspapers in your sweater and a box, because that's <laughs> where you're going to be. Because we know the most important thing is not all this crap about friends and family and community and health and, and no. It's, it's the cash. And so it throws us off in every possible way. But it keeps us in this, again, it's the tension between we have real needs and desires. All of these, you know, community, peace of mind, health, beauty, a sense of security. These are human needs. I mean, these, these make us feel better. And while we want them, none of them can be delivered exclusively or even primarily by money. And yet in a society that is so denominated, so overpoweringly controlled by monetary thinking, we, we then we say, well, if I get some more money, I'll feel more secure. If I get some more money, I'll feel more secure. Uh, by the way, this is, this is what builds gets you the lottery idea, right? And I put the lottery numbers on here. Um, is, wow, if I could win the lottery, right, <coughs> then life would be spectacular. Because I would be rich. What's a spectacular is the rate at which people who win the lottery go bankrupt. I always find this is just, it's just a hugely appealing because it makes me like people more because uh, we're just so daft. Um, but here's the thing. Let's say you're kind of poor and struggling along. You don't have much money and you don't handle it very well. And someone gives you a thousand times that much money. Does this make it easier or harder? It's like if, if, if you want to learn to ride a horse, and you get on this nice, calm horse, this pony, and you go, yeah, you're not doing very well. They say, right, we're going to give you an unbroken Arabian uh, stallion. And we're going to let loose a bunch of feral male, male, uh, females. And then this is going to go good. So get on that. No, you're going to get killed. They don't do this because it would be stupid. It's like, oh, you want to learn to ride a motorcycle? Great, here's a racing bike, right? You don't need a helmet. Have some beers. Go! <laughs> right? That's what winning the lottery is like. But our fantasy of the lottery is, oh, if I had all this money, then everything would be great. And so I, the odds here are 1 in 6.99 million. This is currently of winning our, our lotto prize. 1 in 6.99 million. This is not a very good odds. Um, the way I was trying to conceptualize this is imagine you were going to play Russian roulette with somebody and they had a gun with, say, 7 million chambers. <laughs> and 699,999,999 of those chambers were going to be filled with bullets. <laughs> and one was not going to have one. <laughs> you wouldn't think, yeah, that's a great game. <laughs> <laughs> you would say, yeah, count me in. Here's a dollar. <laughs> I'll play a dollar for that. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> right? No, it's, it's insane. But you reverse that and go, oh, I have equal odds of, of winning something that might not affect statistically overwhelming, perhaps won't help, in fact, harm you in many ways. And we think, ah, yes, that is worth a dollar. It's worth a dollar to dream about how great my life would be if I won six million dollars or seven million or a hundred million. Because then I could buy, what, more beer. <laughs> right? How much beer can you drink? I mean, you can give it a good go, but I think you could give it a go for about five grand, right? See how long you, you hold up. You know, I just, you know, that it's just, I don't know right, what, what the fantasy is. Then I could have this beautiful piano that I can't play. Um, but the, now, if I, see, if I had the money, then I would discipline myself, because nothing makes people disciplined like money. Um, <laughs> then I would discipline myself to actually sit down and learn to play the piano. And I would be good at it because suddenly I wouldn't be uncoordinated and tone deaf and no rhythm. Great. <laughs> right? See, no. On one hand, we laugh, but on the other hand, Ah, in our minds, this imaginary world where our faults are sort of diminished and all of our wants and needs, again, many of them real human psychological, emotional needs, can be fulfilled. And it just it goes on and on. And it, it, imagine like uh, the, the other ones. Some things do, by the way, I should say, some things do have a monetary component. If you want to, say, sail around the world, 
you do have to buy a boat, and you do need to, you know, have some free time, and it's going to be, it's going to be moderately expensive, not horribly expensive, moderately expensive. But the real reason people don't sail around the world is because they don't know how to sail. <laughs> and it takes a lot of work to learn to sail well enough that you would feel confident and comfortable setting off, you know, to sail around the world. That the money is not the primary, even secondary or tertiary barrier. It's that the Pacific Ocean is really incredibly big <laughs> and scary if you don't know how to sail, right? And so people go, ah, people do turn back, by the way. Or, you know, so these, you know, so even things that have a financial component, often it is of the smallest sort. It is not, but we focus on that. And that's why if you, if you go to people's houses, and I, I always like to see this, you'll find you know, unused athletic equipment, unused exercise equipment. <laughs> but when I grew up, our, my friends of mine, their garage was an encyclopedia. It's like a, a, a museum of every exercise fad from 1974 until whatever, <laughs> 2000, right? Because they bought all of them. They didn't use any of them because that, you know, that's the problem with exercise. As it turns out, the equipment might not be the most important part, <laughs> right? You know, I ate the entire treadmill and I'm still gaining weight. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't help. But that, that, is the, that is the imagination. Anybody get the William Sonoma catalog, by the way? It comes in the mail, I love that. Because there it is, right? It's, it's holiday pornography. It is, it's, oh, look, uh, this is the kind of life I fantasize about where we, you know, these beautiful spreads of carefully maintained, and I've built a snowman out of these crazy bunt pans and frosted it, and it's all just like, how the hell do you cut a bunt pan snowman? I don't know. Uh, but, but, you know, there it is. And for the low, low price of, I don't know, $90 for a snowman bunt man cake thing, right? I don't have a place to store. <laughs> I can have a life like that. Except for, of course, they had professional chefs and photographers set this up. This is, you know, who the hell is doing? Nobody's doing this. Right? Or maybe somebody out there is doing it, but they probably aren't using the William Sonoma bunt pan. You know, and, and, but it is the fantasy of it. This is what we love. The notion that I have the time and my kids aren't, you know, hyperactive, and I don't, and I like my relatives, and my house is huge, and I have staff to set this all up and polish the silver and if I just buy this thing, my life will be just like that, right? But it's not true, but it works. This is the amazing <coughs> thing. Um, and so, the, you know, it's, it's extraordinary. Now, this is not the entire story, by the way. There does seem to be, curiously, some pushback in the culture right now. Um, and the example I, I, I like is, to see these is, um, is the built not bought bumper stickers that you see on some crazy looking vehicles. Um, and it's a car culture that says, look, I built this car myself. I mean, I had to buy the parts and whatnot, but um, I thought, well, that'd be cool. I manufactured my own car part. No, they're, they're buying, you know, but they're taking some usually older vehicle or very low end stock vehicle and turning it into something unique. You can't buy this car. It doesn't matter how much money you have. This car is not for sale because I built it myself. Craft breweries, craft wineries, craft cheeses, this is the idea. It's, it's not about making money, it's about making something with your hands and all that. So there does seem to be a certain amount of pushback going on in the society right now against this. I'll be interested to see if this holds up at all. Um, we had the hippie movement um, in the 60s and 70s and that didn't hold up very well. But it did sort of wave that flag and say, hey, look, you know, it's not all about money. It's not all about cash. There are other values. Music, for instance, might be valuable. Um, and so, you know, I, it, maybe we're returning a little bit. Maker movement. Yeah, maybe a make, the maker movement. Yeah, that's what they call the maker movement. Of all kinds of things. That your time, your craft, what you do yourself is what matters, not what you buy. And, I, you know, they're, they're, that, that's really the old world in a way. Because people used to have to make damn near everything because... They were outside the cash economy, or it never occurred to them to be able to afford to buy anything because they didn't have any cash you know, for extraneous things. So as we, as we wrap up money, I do, again, want you to just emphasize, one, uh, we tend to think of money as evil. Money is not evil. Money is like the greatest invention of all time. It's so perfectly and totally and amazingly human. Because, again, it's symbolic. It's imaginary. It's communal. It's all our best things. 
It's a, it's a type of language. But because of that, like being human, it totally and completely baffles us. Right? Because it is a, a part of our imagination, because it is symbolic, because it is communal. We don't set the value of money. Our community sets it. It has to be this way. We haven't, because that's how money is circulated. We didn't choose to live in a society denominated by cash, but we do. Right? That's that's the facts. And and it looks like the, the future will be, if nothing else, even more denominated that way. The cash economy is spreading uh, to encompass virtually everything in the world these days. But what happens is it misleads because it takes really great human characteristics um, and then misapplies them. It, it's so useful for so many things that we think it must be useful for everything. So I'll return finally to the example of the hammer. The hammer is great to build a fence, but we never think, oh, I'll eat some soup with it. <laughs> right? Because we go, ah, you know, the hammer's not going to be good for eating soup with it. It's not the right shape. And we think spoons are good for soup, but we don't think, well, I'll go build a fence with a spoon. We don't make this mistake with physical objects, generally. We make it with money, where we really do try to eat soup with a hammer as far as money is concerned. Because we try to buy things like community, or peace of mind. I'm going to buy some peace of mind. Or I'm going to buy some enlightenment. This is why I like, like Buddhist magazines, because they're always filled with advertising. And I can, I can never think of anything less Buddhist than advertising. Be at one, let go, and buy this. <laughs> right? It, it, it truly is, is, I mean, absolutely antithetical to sort of the, although unless 401k really is the first step on the eightfold path. Um, but but so, so this, this, you know, fundamental needs... Um, driven there to try and, you know, sort of eat spoon, eat, eat soup with a hammer, uh, is what, is where we get baffled by this. Um, and again, this is not uniquely American, but it is exceedingly emphasized in a society that does not have any other way of determining value. We just don't have it. Um, excellence, quality, value, uh, your personal worth, as a society goes, is generally and, and pretty specifically much of the time denominated by money or the perception of money. And so like I said, just imagine if Taco Bell, McDonald's, the whole fast food industry paid 200, 300, 400 thousand dollars a year, these people would be interviewed on TV. Well, how did you get that job at Taco Bell? Because they would be important. They would be valuable because they have a lot of money. <clears throat> That is sort of the modern world we're in, the world of money. Thank you very much.